Thank you for joining me today for a short talk entitled Enhancing Security and Justice Coordination to Counter Transnational Organized Crime, an introduction. My name is Dr. Katherine Lena Kelly, and I am the Associate Professor of Justice and Rule of Law at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. In this video, I will explain why coordination is a critical element of countering transnational organized crime after providing an overview of some of the recent trends in organized crime in Africa. Perhaps we should start with a discussion of how transnational organized crime is defined in the communities of policy and practice. And for that, I will share with you a slide. A common definition of transnational organized crime comes from the United Nations Convention on Transnational Organized Crime, otherwise known as the Palermo Convention. This was established in 2000 and nearly Af every African country has signed the convention. There is no single consistently agreed upon definition of transnational organized crime per se, but there are several common characteristics of organized criminal groups, particularly in terms of their intents and purposes. According to the Palermo Convention, organized criminal groups consist of three or more people existing for a period of time. They have specific intents and purposes. They're acting together with the aim of committing at least one crime, punishable by four years incarceration. And they must be acting together to commit those crimes in order to obtain a financial or other material benefit, whether directly or indirectly. Organized crime is transnational when these activities cross official political borders in some way. In other words, to be transnational, organized crime must be planned, prepared, committed, or have significant consequences in multiple states. Organizations like the United Nations and the UN tend to keep their definitions of transnational organized crime very general. Notice that no specific forms are mentioned in the definitions we were just discussing. This is because methods of transnational organized crime can change over time and according to context. Organized criminal groups learn and adapt to new conditions and to the ways that states are trying to respond to them. So they may seek to leave certain illicit markets and enter others, depending on the political, economic, and social conditions in which they're working. Although policymakers think and talk about transnational organized crime in Africa broadly, there are a variety of specialized forms. There are also a wide variety of criminal actors involved in perpetrating transnational organized crime in African countries. And this is where a new data source, the ENACT Organized Crime Index, Africa, comes in with a helpful framework for thinking about what the challenges of countering transnational organized crime are. It is also a helpful framework for thinking about what factors make African states resilient to transnational organized crime. Much of what I will now present in the first half of this talk comes from the analysis done by the ENACT Consortium as they produced their 2019 Organized Crime Index. The ENACT Consortium, which consists of Interpol, the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime, and the Institute for Security Studies Africa, have taken a systematic look at criminal actors, criminal markets, and 12 different factors that they deem important for African states to build resilience to transnational organized crime. More information about the index, including citations to their report and to the data and methodology, is provided in the recommended readings for this seminar. We also invited two ENACT experts to introduce us to the index in a webinar that the Africa Center held in October 2020, which you can also find on our website and that we will link to in the seminar syllabus. I am a um, uh, bringing this material in um, to the presentation today as well. Much of the content I'll be referencing for this part of the presentation has come from the rich range of resources that ENACT has produced. So turning to this, what do we already know based on the evidence about different patterns of transnational organized crime in African countries? First, I will talk about criminal actors, then about criminal markets, and then about resilience. 
There are four major types of criminal actors that we should be paying attention to. Organized crime is being perpetrated by state embedded actors, criminal networks, foreign actors, and mafia style actors, as you can see from the first part of this slide. Let me say a few words about each of these types of actors. State embedded actors are people within the state who use their connections from their jobs to facilitate transnational organized crime. This could be government ministers, border police, customs officials, forest service officials, or even civil servants who are granting business licenses or permits needed to facilitate interstate commerce. Could also be other people in government. For instance, we recently saw in Chad that 10 people, including several security sector officials and diplomats, were found guilty of trafficking tramadol, a synthetic drug that had come from India and was destined for Libya. In various countries, border officials might be told by certain supervisors not to be present at a particular border post at a particular time, or to let certain people pass without key paperwork or inspection. State embedded actors can also enable organized crime by arranging these kinds of conditions for criminals, organized criminals who are at state borders at a particular time. The second type of actor to look at are its criminal networks. An act describes these as loose networks of criminal associates who are engaged in a variety of illegal activities, but aren't necessarily well known or distinctly identifiable to the people around them, and they don't usually control specific territory. Members of criminal networks have a diversity of backgrounds. They can include people involved in illegal activity, but also people who are involved in legitimate businesses that could serve as fronts for laundering of money or transferring profits from transnational organized criminal activities. Members of criminal networks can include kingpins. These are people who are organizing and overseeing transnational organized crime operations. But members of criminal networks can also include small scale actors who facilitate or enable parts of different transnational organized criminal operations. Some of these smaller scale actors could be engaged in organized crime for profit. Others may merely be seeking a livelihood. And it's important whenever we can in our policy responses to distinguish between the two, although sometimes that is very difficult. Uh, so for example, if we look at the human smuggling market in the Sahel, we see that there are a wide range of major and minor criminal actors involved for profit and for subsistence who are connected to that economy. State embedded actors and criminal networks, these first two types of groups, frequently work together and, or depend on each other in order to perpetrate transnational organized crime. The third type of actor are, is foreign actors. These are people doing organized crime from outside of their own country. In Africa, many foreign actors are from neighboring countries. However, we also see Asian involvement in flora and fauna trafficking in Africa. And we know that Latin American cartels and South Asian criminal actors send supplies of drugs to African coasts. So for instance, the ENACT index reports that Mexican cartels work with Nigerian actors in methamphetamine markets and certain Lebanese diaspora business networks have been part of facilitating money laundering related to various forms of transnational organized crime. We also see foreign private sector companies involved in criminal networks. We've seen examples of this in terms of illegal exports of timber from Mozambique, or in more recent news, reports from Senegal and the Gambia of illegal unregulated and unreported fishing by foreign vessels, um, particularly Chinese trawlers, but also some from um, Europe and North America in the past. Finally, there are mafia style actors involved in transnational organized crime. An act defines these actors as commonly identifiable groups that are well known amongst the populace for conducting organized crime in the areas that they control. Usually they have a known name, a defined leadership, territorial control, and people can identify who are members of these groups. There are a few different examples of mafia style actors in Africa. Gangs in major urban areas of southern South Africa that are involved in drug trafficking or reselling stolen vehicles are one example. We also see mafia style actors in the jihadist groups in the Sahel or rebel groups in DRC 
that engage in illegal mining, wildlife trafficking, or might be taxing the flows of those kinds of products that organized criminals are moving through the territory that those groups control. There are some conclusions to draw here about how common different criminal actors are. Mafia style actors are the least prevalent kind of criminal actor in Africa, according to the index. State embedded actors are identified on the index as the predominant perpetrators of organized crime across the continent. According to an act, state embedded actors and are the criminal actors that people also perceive as doing the most harm through their actions. They are often colluding with members of criminal networks to perpetrate organized crime that does major economic and social harms. The complicity of certain high level state actors in the corruption that can facilitate organized crime is documented perhaps most notably in the UN Economic Commission for Africa's report from the AU high level panel on illicit financial flows. Ultimately, when state actors facilitate transnational organized crime, this diverts tax revenue from the state it deprives citizens of their rightful public resources, and it can stunt growth and development. And it's that development that we need in order to prevent transnational organized crime from taking root in the first place. Turning to markets. The Organized Crime Index tracks the value and the reach of 10 different criminal markets listed here. Human smuggling, human trafficking, arms trafficking, flora crimes, fauna crimes, non-renewable resource crimes, the heroin trade, the cocaine trade, the cannabis trade, and the synthetic drug trade. I'll say a few things about each market. Human trafficking is the recruitment, harboring, transport, transfer, or reception of people for the purposes of exploitation. It occurs through means like coercion, deception, abuse of power, fraud. Human smuggling is different from trafficking. It is the process through which individuals voluntarily engage in irregular migration in order to illegally enter another country. While human smuggling by definition entails voluntary illicit movement across borders, human trafficking can occur um, across borders or within borders, and it is coerced as opposed to being voluntary. All African countries are transit source and destination countries for human trafficking. There are several major routes along which both human smuggling and human trafficking occur. Two of interest to the participants in this seminar are uh, the route through the Sahel in Northern Africa to Europe and the Southern route to South Africa that goes along the Eastern and Southern African coast. In terms of arms trafficking, particularly the trafficking of small arms and light weapons, this has been a major concern over many decades. We saw arms flows into Africa during the Cold War that contributed to this kind of transnational organized crime. And more recent events like the fall of Gaddafi in Libya led to an outflux of arms in the Sahel and the Sahara region more widely that has had lasting effects on the trade. Many small arms in transit these days come from government or United Nations stockpiles. On flora, fauna, and non-renewable resource issues, Interpol identifies trafficking in elephant ivory, great apes, rhino horn, and pangolin scales as major threats across the continent. So is illegal, unregulated, and unreported fishing. In terms of flora crimes, illegal logging is an issue, including the illicit trade in rare hardwoods. And oil bunkering is one of the major non-renewable resource issues. Drug markets, are diverse if you look across the continent. West and East Africa became prime transshipment points for drug trafficking to Europe in the 90s and 2000s. And cocaine is a popular drug market across West Africa in particular. Heroin trafficking is seen in some of these countries, but it's also extremely notable along the Eastern and Southern African coast. Synthetic drugs, like tramadol and methamphetamine are also part of these drug, mar drug markets in different places. Okay, finally, going to resilience. There are 12 resilience factors that the ENACT Organized Crime Index analysts have identified as important to the performance of African states 
in countering transnational organized crime. The 12 factors are listed here very briefly. Um, they are political leadership and governance, government transparency and accountability, international cooperation, national policies and laws, judicial system capacity, law enforcement, anti-money laundering, economic regulatory capacity, victim and witness support, prevention activities, non-state actor and civil society involvement in responding to organized crime, and territorial integrity of states. Now, uh, given these trends that the ENACT Index has shown us, why is coordination across the security and justice sector an important part of how African states build resilience to transnational organized crime? Coordination throughout the security and justice sector to counter transnational organized crime cuts across and touches upon several of these resilience factors that I just mentioned. In public policy, coordination is essentially the process of trying to make different parts of a system and various organizations work together more effectively. Coordination can be a precursor to effective cooperation for achieving strategic goals, like those that your countries may have in relation to their national security strategy or to other policies and plans to counter transnational organized crime. When coordination is done well, uh, coordinating across the security and justice sector to counter crime will help the various institutions and agencies involved achieve an effect that is larger than the sum of its parts. Good coordination will help to address issues that no single institution or agency could fully address on its own as effectively. And good coordination will also minimize competition between the different institutions and agencies that are involved in any endeavor. When done well, security and justice coordination will be based on clear definitions of roles and responsibilities that also facilitate long-term problem solving. Resilience generally refers to the ability of people, countries, institutions, or systems to weather difficulties and deal with adverse shocks in ways that are adaptable, that mitigate harm, and that help to reduce future vulnerabilities. So in terms of countering transnational organized crime, showing resilience involves confronting asymmetries in the resources, the capabilities, and the constraints of state actors and transnational organized criminal groups. Transnational organized criminal actors work through networks that foster a pragmatic borderless approach to their end goal, profit seeking. And so their diverse networks unite criminal syndicates, corrupt government officials, and local people who enable different aspects of transnational organized crime. And they work together to exploit cross-border differences in economics and policies. And that creates and fuels illicit markets behind trafficking, poaching, and smuggling of various sorts. Criminals quickly adapt to evade African states' efforts to track them down, to detect them, and to punish them. So to be resilient, states must anticipate these possibilities for adaptation and put mechanisms and practices in place that allow states to respond quickly and nimbly to address how these networks of criminals are evolving and are behaving. This is where coordination comes in handy. There are several different aspects that are useful. Cross-border coordination between different countries, security and justice actors, interagency and interministerial coordination on the national level, and coordination efforts that are rooted in local citizen and community perspectives, experiences, and approaches to dealing with transnational organized crime. Just to give you a few examples of cross-border and international interagency coordination, this could include a variety of things like passing provisions for the judicial police to deploy jointly with the military to counter transnational organized crime. Standing up special units focused on transnational organized crime that combine military officers, police, and gendarmes in their strategic deployments to borderlands or other places where 
they're going on mission to deal with transnational organized crime. It could include linking special judicial units or interagency judicial focal points to those counterparts that they have in the security sector. And of course, cross-border coordination involves bilateral or regional mutual legal assistance agreements and putting in place regional police cooperation agreements. So going back to the definition of resilience, resilience also hinges upon taking measures to reduce future vulnerabilities. To achieve this in the context of countering transnational organized crime, African states need to coordinate security and justice efforts to counter transnational organized crime in ways that advance citizen security and not just state or regime security. That means that they need to attend to the underlying factors that make states, citizens, and communities susceptible to transnational organized crime. Underlying factors enabling transnational organized crime are not only related to hard security, but also to development and governance. So local livelihoods matter. Um, people's trust in state security institutions that may be trying to counter crime matter a great deal. This is why including communities in dialogues or consultations to shape state response is important. All this is to say that transnational organized crime is at its root not only a military and criminal justice issue, but also a broader security development and governance challenge that concerns both state and society. So when seeking to enhance coordination to counter transnational organized crime, it's worth considering what roles and responsibilities can be for state security and justice actors, as well as local authorities, communities, and citizens. To conclude, although efforts are underway in various countries and regions to coordinate in useful ways to counter transnational organized crime, there's still much work to be done, lessons to be learned, and experiences to be shared on this topic, there are also ideas and commitments to coordination that could be built upon. The African Union's African Peace and Security Architecture Roadmap from 2016 to 2020 included transnational organized crime. The African Union is interested in improving cross-border collaboration across member states in countering transnational organized crime. And there's also a sense that cross-border intelligence sharing and police co cooperation could make some major contributions on that level. AFRAPOL has been set up already to facilitate coordination, particularly among law enforcement bodies. In addition, as mentioned at the start, the Palermo Convention also elaborates on how signatory countries can coordinate on law enforcement matters, information sharing, mutual legal assistance, joint investigations, extradition, and a variety of other measures. So exploring these opportunities related to these frameworks is not only a measure of good faith, it can also help countries realize their full economic potential. Thank you so much.